Just when the on-field drama of the football finally seemed to be eclipsing all else coming out of Qatar, the World Cup hosts back in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. Doha firmly denies any part in the piles of cash uncovered by Belgian police or the arrests that include a, a vice president of the European Parliament. The greasing of the wheels uh, appears to have come as the EU started to ponder visa-free travel for Qatari citizens. Why would the Gulf Emirate even want that waiver? More broadly, we'll be asking our panel about the stain on EU institutions and lobbying rules that apply varyingly to corporations and to nations that solicit Brussels decision makers. With big battles of influence raging from everything from Russia's invasion of Ukraine to U.S. big tech's blowback against regulation, what can this scandal teach us? The scandal breaks as Hungary finds itself in the crosshairs of the Commission over misused EU funds. How to apply universal standards when it comes to ethics and corruption? And can those standards be enforced across 27 nations? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the cash that's allegedly from Qatar. And joining us uh, from Brussels, Alberto Alemano, professor of EU law at, uh, the, uh, uh, financial, uh, at the finance school, HEC Paris, founder of The Good Lobby. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Commentator and entrepreneur Jakob Hessler is with us as well. How are you, sir? Hello, very well. Nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us. And we're also in the company of uh, Franz Wild, reporter at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, co-author of How Qatar Hacked the World Cup, which is a riveting uh, read. Thanks for being with us from London. Hi, thank you. The uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Formal charges against five Brussels insiders, including uh, the vice president, one of the vice presidents of the European Parliament. The fallout keeps growing in uh, what's fast becoming the EU's biggest corruption scandal uh, in years. Kemi Knight has more. Many are calling it the biggest corruption scandal in European Parliament history. Greece froze all the assets of EU Parliament Vice President Eva Kiley on Monday after her detention over the weekend. The former TV anchor has also been suspended from her role in European Parliament and expelled from the centre-left PASOK party. Bank accounts, companies and other financial assets will be scrutinised by authorities, including a company she recently founded with her Italian partner and EU parliamentary assistant, Francesco Giorgi. Belgian prosecutors reportedly found bags of cash in her home when searching 16 houses in Brussels as part of the probe. They seized a total of €600,000 in their search. Kylie occupies a powerful role in Parliament and has been a fierce defender of Qatar ever since her visit to the Gulf state before the start of the World Cup. Local media reports that her partner has also been charged in this affair, along with former EU MEP Antonio Panzeri. Panzeri is the president of Fight Impunity, a Brussels-based NGO Georgie is also involved with. Belgian media has described them as being at the top of this criminal organisation. The scandal has sparked fury and concern amongst EU officials. If my fury, my anger, my sorrow do not come across, please be assured that they are very much present, along with my determination for this house to grow stronger. Make no mistake, the European Parliament, dear colleagues, is under attack. European democracy is under attack, and our way of open, free, democratic societies are under attack. Eva Kiley, as well as three others, are now being detained after being charged for participation in a criminal organisation, money laundering and corruption. Qatar has denied any wrongdoing. Uh, before we go into the allegations uh, regarding Qatar, Alberto Alemano, let me begin with you by asking, uh, you just heard uh, Roberta Mezzola, the president of the European Parliament, talking about democracy being uh, under attack. Uh, she also said uh, we in Europe would rather be cold than bought. What, is, what does she mean? Well, I, I'm not sure exactly what uh, the president of the parliament means by those statements that uh, might seem a bit uh, overblown. Uh, obviously, here we see a systemic attempt by a third country uh, to influence economic and political decision-making at the European level by using corruption, not lobbying. 
We are not talking about lobbying here. We are talking about corruption. And as soon as influence exists, because there are funding that are basically going to the best interest of the individual, because there is a conflict there in that individual, on the one hand is serving the public interest, on the other is making a return, uh, we are in the corruption space. And that's where uh, politics, and in particular the European Parliament, has to basically change the rules of the game and try to make their members much more accountable for what they do. As of today, European members of parliament are free to do and to meet whoever they want, and they always historically oppose any form of accountability imposed on them. So that's the sad part of the story that we need to remind also the press of the European parliament today. Now, I want to get back to that point of how you uh, change the rules. You, you penned a piece about it in French broadsheet uh, Le Monde uh, this uh, Tuesday. Uh, Franz Wild, l l first off, um, what would be in it for Qatar here in this case? Uh, well, we know, uh, we've known for a long time that uh, Qatar has uh, global ambitions um, in terms of expanding its sphere of influence. You can see that in some of the political dynamics they've been involved in uh, in the Middle East and beyond. Um, and obviously, you know, remember this is a tiny state um, with a lot of uh, uh, energy wealth. Um, and so we, we know specifically that they've been quite creative in um, their methods in terms of how to have that, achieve that kind of influence. And this scandal, um, it doesn't, frankly, uh, surprise me a huge amount. I mean, um, we we did an investigation recently into the use of hacking. Um, so we being uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in, in the UK, uh, together with the Sunday Times here in Britain. Uh, and in as part of our investigation, we, we investigate, we've um, unearthed some new information uh, relating to hacking. Uh, and we found out that um, the Qatari entities were behind a fairly large uh, hacking campaign targeting specifically people who were being um, critical of uh, Qatar's World Cup. And re remember, the World Cup, again, is not least uh, an attempt by Qatar to project its power on the global stage. Because we, we had France... Uh, a first Qatar, in the, here in France, we remember a first Qatar gate, and that is the investigation into uh, uh, whether or not people in high places and uh, names that have been linked to that investigation uh, are uh, the former president, Nicolas Sarkozy, the former head of UEFA, Michel Platini, in Qatar getting uh, the World Cup. But today, uh, they've got the World Cup. They've, uh, they, they, everybody's watching the tournament. Why would they need uh, to uh, uh, spread their largesse in such a manner? Well, I think uh, a lot of this predates the actual World Cup itself. And even once you do have the World Cup, it's, um, it's really important to maintain that influence. And obviously, there are many critics uh, of the World Cup. And, you know, particularly one thing that we've seen uh, spring up quite often is a kind of rivalry uh, with the UAE. And so a lot of it has been focused um, on that rivalry. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the thing I would really focus on more than Qatar even is actually, you know, the U European actors here. It's, it's just um, frankly quite unbelievable that, you know, you've got European politicians who are, who are accepting this kind of money. And it's, but it's, again, it's not new. You, you have, um, you've got London, uh, you've got lawyers, London, you've got, um, you know, sports people like David Beckham or Andrea Pirlo, uh, you know, who's accepting huge amounts of money uh, from Qatar. And, and, you know, their job very specifically is to make sure that um, Qatar's image is protected. Right. But in their cases, and I'll put it to you, uh, uh, Jakob Hessler, uh, Andrea Pirlo, uh, David Beckham, uh, this is an illicit cash. Uh, they're 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 lobbying, and just like Zinedine Zidane did for uh, well, Qatar's they're, World they're, Cup bid. They are private people, but I think what the what the real issue is when we go to Europe, I think, is when we look at how the EU evolved, it was very commission centric. The commission is very managerial and administrative. 
And then at some point, everyone said, we have a democracy deficit. So we started to increase the power, the visibility of the European Parliament. But we didn't match to, or to start compensating the democracy deficit, and we are far from it, with compensating for the transparency deficit. And we basically let all, many of these European institutions, the rules are too lax. There is no register of foreign interest. The lobbying rules are incredibly archaic. What the MEPs and others are allowed to do or not allowed to do when they leave, nobody really cares. It's some obscure bureau of the parliament that takes care of things. And there is, and most of all, and I think that's, Alberto, what you wrote today in your piece, there's also no authority, independent, that would work such some sort of a watchdog. But the fact that we don't have it is in part, I think, due to the fact that we are only also adapting to the idea that there is a real democracy, there has to be real democracy functioning and that real democracy needs real transparency. And so it takes a scandal like this to realize that and then to start say, okay, so what are the kind of changes in the rules and in the way they're being applied that need to be made? Uh, Alberto Alemano, the president of uh, the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, this Monday, reviving an idea that when she campaigned for that job in 2019, it first put forth, and that is an ethics board that oversees all EU institutions. What was your reaction when you heard that? Uh, my reaction was, finally, finally, she, she remembers her original promise uh, she made in 2019 when she came to power. She basically said, well, ethics is a big thing. You might remember a few commissioner. Uh, including the French designated commissioner, uh, who didn't go through because there were allegedly some ethical issues. And this prompted Ursula von der Leyen to promise the creation of an ethics body that for the first time would have centralized all the monitoring power, all the investigative power, and functionally the possibility of sanctioning uh, both the staff and the elected working in the European institutions in case of departure uh, from the ethical rules. Uh, unfortunately, that promise got kind of... Uh, they were forgotten uh, over the last uh, three years and a half. The European Parliament, paradoxically itself, pushed the Commission to actually come up with a proposal. It's the job of the Commission, not of the Parliament, to come up with better rules uh, on this. And actually, the, 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 the European Commission hasn't been very, very vocal uh, into turning into a reality Why? Uh, this proposal. Well, I think there is um, an historical uh, reticence uh, in creating stricter rules uh, that might require the reporting of all the meetings of the members of parliament and also other officials. There is also a sense that as of today, the president of each institution is already competent to sanction those individuals. So they can say there is a system, it's not uh, perfect, but there is a system. And this has created a lot of complacency. And how the hope is that this uh, scandal, which by nature and scale is certainly the gravest ever and very shocking for many of us, will create the political momentum to finally have a European Commission which is much more braver and courageous, I would say, in uh, putting forward a proposal that we're just the beginning of a reform. We just not need an ethics body. We also need to make a transparency register for all lobbying, including that coming from third countries, much more transparency and accountable, and finally having a traceability mechanism uh, that ensure all citizens uh, to know basically who are the people who have been involved in taking these particular decisions, uh, who the members of parliament, commissioner and other institutions have been meeting uh, before informing themselves about a particular policy file. For the time being, uh, Franz Weil, the, the, the uh, public's imagination is captured by talk of 600,000 euros in cash. Uh, the Belgian federal police um, uh, picked up the father of uh, Eva Kaili and then let him go, realizing he was just, he was just there to, to uh, as somebody uh, carrying it, literally a, a bagman in this case. 600,000 in cash. What was your reaction when you heard that? Well, that was definitely the, the detail that stood out for me, too. Um, it's pretty... Um, they is it, you know you kind of have a very good reason uh, to to have that kind of amount of cash uh, <laughs> just hanging about um, and in, in many countries um, you know that that that's illegal uh, 
Remember, in just to sort of draw a parallel, in South Africa, um, uh, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa was found to have uh, similarly large sums of money stuffed in a sofa, uh, which was, was which was. Um, yeah, Farmgate uh, is still unfolding as we speak. It, it is unfolding, but what you can see there is that's you know at this stage the biggest threat to his political career. Um, and it, you kind of have this notion that it, in sort of Western Europe and the EU, you, you know, you wouldn't have this sort of a scandal. Um, and the fact that it's, I, I think the fact that, the, you know, that we have had this points exactly to to the measures being required that we've just been talking about. Um, it's it's quite alarming. Uh, Eva Kaili, again, this is, she's uh, uh, just been stripped of her, uh, her, her duties as one of the vice presidents of the European Parliament, a member of the uh, uh, of the center-left uh, PASOK party in Greece. Uh, she turned heads when she defended Qatar last month. The Greek TV journalist turned uh, politician uh, speaking at the time before the European Parliament. Cup in Qatar is a proof, actually, of how sports diplomacy can achieve a historical transformation of a country. I alone said that Qatar is a front runner in labor rights, abolishing kafala and reducing minimum wage, despite the challenges that even European companies are denying to enforce these laws. Uh, Jakob Hessler, what, would, what was the reaction? At the time, uh, I, I know that other MPs, MEPs were surprised. Uh, at this posture, but it left it at that. Did the, do you think that's what may have tipped off the investigation? I mean, it's obviously too soon to say. It's very soon to say. Let's say I think some people were really surprised, given even in her own parliamentary group, because she represents, I think, the socialists, social democrats, widely speaking, and I think she was not speaking for the majority of her group. But we have no idea what, what, what I mean, I have no idea what, what, what tipped her off. Yeah, and it's her partner, a former Italian member of uh, the European Parliament that's also in the spotlight, Bergamo region native uh, Pier Antonio Panzeri, who uh, was, when he was an MEP, a champion of human rights. Uh, he uh, then go went on to chair an advocacy group called Fight Impunity, among the big name uh, honorary board members who've quit, by the way, in the last 48 hours, the former Italian foreign minister, Emma Bonino, uh, the French socialist uh, prime minister, uh, Bernard Cazeneuve. Uh, is this, Alberto Alemano, this story, is it Greek or is it Italian, this story? Uh, I think it's a, it's a European story. It's a story of non-profit organizations existing here in Brussels that uh, count on the legitimacy and authority of many individuals, famous, influential individuals, those you just mentioned, who basically give legitimacy to those, those non-profits to act and to be present in town. We call this phenomenon a phenomenon of astroturfing. Astroturfing is the creation of fake grassroots. These are groups yeah. are not representative of society, but they advance an interest and they look legitimate, but they are not legitimate. So I think here we have a clear example of astroturfing happening is not only about the third countries setting up astroturf, sometimes it's corporations, it can be any form of special interest that is trying to get visibility and access to power. And this is pretty clear. We have an intersection of former politicians monetizing their access, uh, while at the same time uh, making sure that certain third countries uh, make uh, their voice heard at, at the European level. So this is a broader phenomenon. It's still we see below the sea level, I would say, and that's why this scandal is probably the tip of an iceberg. We, we are going to see so many ramifications happening, both within the scandal, but also other stories, other episodes that probably have produced. We're going to be seeing whistleblowers. People are going to be uh, blowing the whistle and reporting what they didn't feel uh, comfortable to, to report to in the same way as the Me Too movement uh, has unleashed uh, an incredible social phenomenon that basically make visible what it was not visible, but existed. Uh, Alberto, there's another Italian among those arrested who's, uh, who's, who's uh, been in the news recently for other reasons. Luca Vizantini is his name. He was recently elected as General Secretary of the International Trade Union Conference. What was your reaction to that? Well, uh, I, was, uh, I was certainly shocked uh, in the sense that you would not expect a trade unionist to take 
uh, a lenient step towards Qatar when talking about labor rights. But when you look at the pattern of its declarations over the last few weeks regarding Qatar, it's basically doing the same as the other members coming from the socialist family. So all of this together really convey a bad yeah. image, an ugly image of our political representatives and also our representatives of the workers in this particular case. So this is pretty surreal. I think I think the <clears throat> I think the International Office of Labor estimated what 35 death in the construction of the stadiums, which is roughly less than one tenth of what even the Qataris own minister said with roughly 450 which obviously is nothing compared to the numbers put forward by The Guardian, which is, what, 6,500. So I don't claim that any of the number is true. It just seems the variance is just very impressive and seems a bit too big for people to get, you know, to, to get it that wrong. Franz Wild? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, it, it, your, your, your thoughts on, on what, on the one hand... Uh, has been reported, and on the other hand, how it's being described. <clears throat> um, sorry, in terms of the on the in terms of the um, workers in Qatar, is that what yes. you're asking? Right. Yeah. I mean, as as Jakob was just saying, um, I I totally agree. It's there is a, a serious dissonance between the different uh, figures. Uh, I haven't been there myself. I haven't I haven't looked into it myself, but I've. I do know people who, who have, and by all accounts, the uh, conditions have, have been appalling. Um, and, you, you know, again, let, let's kind of try and remember what this kind of influence campaign, either through direct corruption or um, legal means, is about. And a lot of it is about... Um, Uh, a kind of brushing over those sorts of issues, and obviously it's be, it's been a good thing that a lot of people have have kept up the kind of uh, pressure and focus on that subject. Um, I mean, one of the targets of the hacking campaign, which we wrote about, was a um, Parisian activist uh, called Rakaya Jallo, um, and and she had just she 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 uh, she's a broadcaster and she'd raised this issue. Um, so we don't know if there's an exact correlation between her raising those issues and her being targeted uh, by Qatar. Um, but, but you know, that's the kind of obvious but. conclusion you might make. Well, for, for more on this, joining our conversation from uh, Strasbourg uh, is a Green Member of the European Parliament, Anna de Parnay uh, Gronenberg. Thank you for being with us here in, in, in the France 24 uh, debate. Uh, let me begin by asking you, uh, you, were, uh, uh, you saw earlier that plenary session that took place uh, uh, where you are, and we, we were listening earlier to some of the strong words uh, by the European Uh, Parliament President Roberta Mazzola. What was your What were your thoughts when you heard uh, when you heard the, her, her talking about again uh, th this notion that uh, it's democracy that's under attack? Yes, exactly. That what I felt actually. Um, our really uh, everyday life and everyday work as a as a deputy for for European citizens has been um, really threatened now through this. Uh, revelations and so it's it's a really personal shock in the first place because you really feel uh, that um, yeah some countries maybe some some really big um, profit organization are just uh, taking um, a really serious institution like the European democracy uh, under attack and want to influence um, our work so influence the voice of, of, uh, of the citizen. Now, you and heard, so you heard a on really that point. That feeling and the second thought I had. Go ahead, the second thought. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't hear you. No, no, I was saying go, I was saying go ahead uh, with your. I, I interrupted you. Oh, okay. No, and the second thought I have, of course, it's, it's more than that. It's not just a personal shock, but we have to react as a parliament. We have to be sure that uh, such. Um, criminal energy is not happening in our house. So we have a lot of uh, 
Yeah, we have a lot of, of thoughts now about that. The first of all, we, we want to see an inquiry committee, so really looking after all these details and uh, to be really transparent towards all the citizens so that they know what happened. And we have to look after our own rules also. How can we make sure that uh, structurally we don't have these weaknesses so that we can um, try to tackle as much as possible uh, such things not to happen in the future? Now, uh, Roberta Metzola, the, 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 the parliament president, she, she said in her statement, we'd rather be cold than bought. And our correspondent, uh, Dave Keating, was telling us, Anna, that uh, it could be that that was not necessarily a reference to Qatar. It could have also been a reference to other foreign countries. He was thinking particular of Russia. And when we had Alberto Alemano in our conversation talking about how there could be more revelations to come, uh, in the days ahead. Is this about Qatar or is it about more? We don't know, actually. We don't have more information than the broader uh, citizens, so we don't know. Actually, the um, Belgium justice is now um, acting and looking for all the facts, and uh, we have some um, serious suspicions, but uh, we cannot, as uh, parliamentarians, have more information. So we have the we have to let the police do the investigations and uh, we have to think on what can we do as, a, as an institution to, uh, to protect ourselves and, and to be sure that when some attack from other countries, maybe, uh, I don't know, as happening, we, are, we have good structures to protect ourselves and our democracy. Anna, do you uh, subscribe to the, what the president of the uh, European Commission is suggesting, uh, an ethics board for all EU institutions? Yes, that would be nice. As, as Green Party, we are asking for this since years and years because we know that there are some weaknesses and we want more transparency and we want an external body looking at uh, what is happening in this House. And also the lobby register where we have as parliamentarians to normally put on all our meetings with lobbies, even small or bigger organization, um, we want to see also um, when we are meeting with representative of a country that should be explicitly uh, written in this transparency register that each um, corporation can have a look and each citizen, of course, also. Right. And the, the, uh, among the other suggestions, uh, uh, Jakob Hessler, you, you, you were here in France witness to when we got rid of uh, members of parliament who, uh, French members of parliament, who also could double as mayor or have other jobs. Uh, that in the European Parliament, one of the few remaining institutions in Europe where uh, you can have a second job. Your thoughts on that? Well, I think, I, I think we need to really distinguish. And the way Alberto has said in the beginning, there is one thing, which is there are practices that we condemn or we say there is doubling of offices or having a second job. And then there is outright corruption. And I think we need to be very clear that those, I mean, those debates can overlap if neglectable or badly drawn rules encourage corruption, but they do not necessarily cause corruption. And I, th I, and I think there's, there's just one point I think mm. that I would like to add. I'm not sure that the, the metaphor of we are under attack is really helpful. I completely agree with the measures, the registry, but I think it's more like we need to be clear with ourselves. This is more an own goal in football terms than a real attack, because attack seems like we need to defend ourselves. No, this is not defend ourselves against Qatar. This is just make sure that our own people behave properly, and, uh, because there will always be people that will go out and will try and corrupt and influence one way or another. And Qatargate, by the way, comes the same day when the EU discussed uh, whether to suspend uh, some 5.8 billion euros uh, in recovery fund money for Hungary. Uh, over corruption issues. Uh, that had Prime Minister Viktor Orban baiting and tagging uh, the European uh, Parliament as he posted this meme to Twitter, uh, 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 say, poking fun uh, at, uh, at the European Parliament. Uh, what was your reaction to that, Jakob? I mean, is it... Is, well, I... Well, beside the fact that, you know, I'm not sure I subscribe to the sense of humor, um, I, I'm not sufficiently a specialist of Hungarian politics, but there are certainly 
more than rumors that suggest that not everything is happening uh, as it should be there. Anna de Parnay Grunenberg, how do you, how do you explain this to public opinion again? So because basically the, the message from from Viktor Orbán seems to be look, they're all corrupt. Yeah, that's really easy from his side, and that's a really a pity, of course, because he is maybe taking a, a take that a few citizens are really feeling now. But he is really the one who is just threatening his own justice and really uh, had some severe case of corruption in his own country. So that's a really a bad joke, I would say, and it's uh, really also attacking uh, the weakness. But I'm really clear that we have at the parliament be clear that it's so bad when such attacks are happening and that we have been a possibility to, to make these ha attacks happen because that's really the weak point. We have some people that is severely are suspicious now that they are really open to corruption. And so that's really our own business as a parliament to look for those weaknesses. And uh, that's about ourselves, like uh, Jakob just said. And uh, I think Orban is just stepping in and uh, making his, uh, his, his bad jokes uh, to, weaken, to weaken the European democracy. Yeah, there's what's illegal and uh, there's what's unethical. Uh, back in 2016, two years after José Manuel Barroso retired as European Commission president, there was outrage uh, when the Portuguese who was at the helm during the financial crisis took his contacts book over with him to Wall Street investment bank Goldman Sachs and got a job. Uh, outrage, uh, perhaps, uh, but uh, Alberto Alemano, um, recruitment of top EU officials, that's perfectly legal. Uh, well, uh, it is up to a point. Yeah, of course, there uh, as is a, a result difference. Of, as, a result of, as a result of that particular revolving door of uh, <laughs> Mr. Barroso, the European Commission decided to extend the so-called cool-off period cool of 36 months. That basically means that a former commissioner has to wait for three years before monetizing his own access to, to, to power. And... Um, uh, this was the outcome of, of a complaint that was lodged by uh, several civil society organizations, including myself at the time, and we collected uh, hundreds of thousands of signatures showing to the European institution a desire for a reform. These are incremental changes. These are tweaks that are made and will be made in the coming days and weeks. But will this be enough uh, in order to change the norm, which are social and political norms, that are much deeper than the norms. And I think the role of political parties should also be mentioned in our conversation. I don't think we should simply think that the institution by themselves can exercise oversight on their own elected. I think the first job is that of European political party to select the right candidates and to be able to police on their behavior. What we just witnessed in the last few days show and suggest that the existing political parties are not necessarily doing a, jo a good job in creating rules which are clear, which are predictable, which are enforced, first of all, at the party level, before entrusting the institutions and relying on the institutions to actually follow up on those on those elected. So what is the role of European political parties in these particular circumstances to actually do a better job in monitoring and exercising oversight on their own party? It's just too easy to expel them, uh, expose to once the fact uh, arises. They should actually be much more proactive and and, uh, and capable and enlightened in, in selecting their, their new political class. Uh, Alberto, when you talk about political parties, do you mean that the blocs that are represented in the European Parliament in Strasbourg to this <clears> week, <throat> or do you mean the, the national political parties they come from? In, in this particular case, uh, PASOK in Greece, uh, the, 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 uh, the Parti Democratico in, 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 in Italy? Uh, it is both. First of all, it's the job of the national parties, because it's still the national parties who select the members of the European Parliament. The European elections are very national in nature. Uh, Europeans vote on different dates. Uh, they vote for national parties, for national programs. But it's also the job of the European political groups. Uh, once uh, uh, the Greeks, uh, they come uh, to uh, Strasbourg, and the Italians and the French, and they come together in the same group. Well, it is the European political party who should actually keep an eye on them and making sure 
that their uh, meetings are reported, as we just heard from the Green representatives, that their own uh, activities are in line with the values of that particular political group. And here we all feel uh, that uh, all these political parties are not necessarily positioning themselves. They know that each of them contains some bad apples. Each of them uh, has some joint responsibility in the current situation in one way or another. So you see so much reticence of those political parties at both national and European level to step in and to present a bold reform uh, which would entail, for instance, the setting up of a European ethics body, something we have been hearing a lot over the last few hours, but very little over the past of the last four years since uh, this proposal was put forward by Ursula von der Leyen. So will all of a sudden will be real, genuine interest, or we're going to forget about this scandal in, in one week time, as it is often the case. In one week time, is uh, whether they, they forget about it. Uh, uh, Franz Wild, uh, in uh, the UK in 2009, they had an MP's expenses scandal, and it really rocked the country. There was a before and an after. Are, are you, are, does what's happening, what's unfolding right now in Brussels conjure memories of that? Yeah, I mean, I do think that scandal was maybe slightly different in nature. Um, but hopefully uh, this is kind of a watershed moment in that it actually uh, kind of shakes everyone out of their slumber. Um, and I mean, a point I might make is that, you know, it, the, the fact that there aren't any actual rules in place at this point, um, and obviously there are some... Um, but, but also in terms of second jobs and all those sorts of issues, conflicts of interest, um, both currently legal, but also the, the illegal stuff. It is so essential that um, politicians and also the institutions actually take steps proactively right now to to address those gaps, because, you know, you've got to kind of see it in a much broader context. And if you think about um, Qatar kind of trying to influence European institutions. Well, it, it's not only Qatar, is it? I mean, we know, for example, uh, Chinese um, CCP uh, influence operations, for example, in, in Australia uh, or in the US, how they kind of target all sorts of levels of uh, politics in order to have quite a deep, um, you know, have, have, have layers of political influence. Uh, and, and we've had examples of that here in the UK as well. Um, and and so there are, especially with the, the sort of current, uh, I suppose, geopolitical reorganization of the world, um, that I think is is going to be more and more uh, important. And you know, also just to expand it even beyond that, um, you know, we, we we have the political class, um, but we also have, and and this is an area of uh, focus that uh, me and my team have is, you know, we have the kind of pro professionals working. Uh, both in Brussels, but also in London uh, or in Washington, New York, uh, people who uh, represent foreign actors. And, and often it's not entirely clear. They might be kind of designated as a lawyer for a specific role. But um, the, the fact that they're part of the establishment in, let's say, Britain, um, means that they have the, the, the access to uh, represent uh, these foreign actors. And Unless you really create very robust rules and regulations around this, uh, your systems are really going to be quite vulnerable. And, and now is really a time to get your house in order. Jakob Hessler. Well, I think, and I think to add to the foreign dimension, I mean, I think in the UK, we're currently witnessing the potential scandal of corruption, not 600,000, but in the order of, what, 29 million pounds that were found on trust funds belonging supposedly to the family of a rather freshly ennobled uh, lady, which raises enough questions so that I think on this kind of question, I think no one either in the UK nor in, in the EU can really look at each other and be tri feel triumphantly superior. So, uh, Anna uh, de Parley Grunenberg, if you listen to Franz Wald, you, the idea is you have to go fast because uh, there's pressure coming from the likes of China, pressure coming from the likes of Russia, pressure from other parts. Uh, how fast can reform come? 
Um, I hope there will be really an after this scandal and that we are taking all our power together at the European Parliament and think really seriously about all kind of internal um, weaknesses we have and also kind of attacks that could come also on the um, cyber attacks we, we are facing and that we are really stepping now in a, in a new phase that we have to be fully transparent but we have not only to say it but we have to control our own transparency as well. We have to um, let the door open to an ethical body that could look at the severe um, misconstruction there is maybe in this parliament. And uh, I'm not now here that I can say you all the recipes, but we have to be open to make this inquiry um, commission and to, to let the, the, the view of outside in the parliament so that we can really sure to be the best prepared. But of course, at the end, there is criminal energy somewhere and in a, in a big forces. I, I cannot be sure that we are going to, to face it. But to be really pr to, to stay proud to be a European parliamentarian, uh, that has had been really difficult this this weekend, um, and uh, so we want to speak about really important uh, things like how to tackle the climate change or the biodiversity loss and not being obliged just to have a look in our own we weaknesses. But now it's on the page. We have to be uh, clear on that. We have to uh, to have better structure to tackle all these. Um, possibly attacks from outside, but also from the inside. Uh, Alberto Alemano, forgive me for, for speaking like a, a communications consultant here, but uh, how, do you, how does the European Parliament get ahead of this? Hmm. Uh, the European Parliament has no choice, has to react very quickly, not by saying that this is an attack to European democracy, but by saying this is a self-inflicted damage. We haven't introduced the right rules of the game for our members. And it is about time we acknowledge this uh, with a lot of humility and we come together in a bipartisan way to put forward rules which are credible and which are implemented not only by the parliament, not only by the European political parties, but through accountability mechanisms that empower European citizens, civil society organizations and watchdogs to actually monitor constantly the respect for new political and social rules that today don't exist. They simply don't exist. The, the reflex that uh, many European members parliament do have are not the right ones, are not the correct ones. So it is about time to invest into our European democracy if we want to preserve what we have achieved of the last 70 years, which is a pretty peaceful uh, overall area uh, in which our uh, lifestyles uh, is and remains uh, uh, um, something that many people, many regions around the world uh, like uh, to, to follow and aspire to. So this is what I think is at stake, is the credibility of the European Union vis-a-vis -vis its own citizens, but also vis-a-vis -vis other regions of the world. The European Parliament, as the European Union, are watched uh, today uh, much more than in the past. And we need to be a, able uh, to hold such a greater public scrutiny coming on us. And you were saying again, just to repeat, that uh, uh, you think there's going to be more whistleblowing and more revelations. Yeah, I, I do sense uh, that this might be the tip of an iceberg, that uh, this scandal might have major ramifications by affecting also members of other European institutions, perhaps other European political families, but also that what just happened uh, in relation to Qatar uh, might have occurred in relation to other countries and other regions of the world. It could be China, it could be Russia. We all know because of investigative journalists that there have been a lot of funding coming into Brussels. We have a lot of interest in this gray area. We all recognize today this kind of fake nonprofits, this kind of meetings which are not declared, uh, lend themselves uh, to foreign influence to actually occur and affect our decision making. So I wouldn't be too surprised if in the coming hours and days we're going to see this scandal uh, to lead to uh, other major revolutions and developments and possibly uh, through whistleblowers, other reports actually to occur. Well, you could say, ironically, maybe that's the end of impunity right here. May not what they had in mind when they created the, their charity, but it's maybe what they have provoked against their own interest. Yeah, the, the Let's end, hope. The end of impunity. Uh, yeah, end impunity. Of course, the name of that of that charity that was um, uh, that, uh, whose uh, whose boss uh, is one of those. 
uh, who has uh, been formally indicted in this uh, scandal. I want to thank you, Jakob Hessler. Uh, Anna duparle Gronenberg for being with us uh, from Strasbourg in the European Parliament. Alberto Alamano in uh, Brussels, Franz Wild in uh, London. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Thank you.